So welcome everyone and um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the final talk in the um, Earthlings Anthropocene Art Talk series. Um, I've seen many of you before, I've got many familiar names from the previous talks, but I'll just repeat myself for those of you who are new. Um, I'm Francesca, I'm a final year PhD student in History of Art at the University of York and this series has been co-organised with uh, Louise Yuzhu Yang, who um, sadly can't be with us today. Um, we would like to say a huge thank you to the University of York Centre for Modern Studies and the Leverhulme Centre for Anthropocene Biodiversity who have supported this series. Um, so again, this is a repetition, so sorry for you, those have been before, but this series explores contemporary arts interaction with science and technology concerning the relationship between the human and the natural world, scoping humanity um, within the significant geological instance now known as the Anthropocene, which has such decisive power to change the enormous history and future of this planet. The term is contested as much as it is used. And in this series, we hope to explore the colonial, political, historical, technological and social complexities involved in contemporary arts navigation of this terrain from multiple um, geographical perspectives. So in this talk, we are greatly honoured to have uh, Ria Rizaldi and Anna Bilbao Yato um, join the conversation to explore extractivism and global industry. Ria is an artist and filmmaker and he's just finished um, his PhD in the materiality of moving images at um, City University of Hong Kong and he's have, has an exhibition coming up at a job for the Biennale, which is fantastic news. Um, his main focus is on the relationship between capital and technology, extractivism and theoretical fiction. And today we are going to focus on Riyadh's work, Casa from 2019, which concerns the exploitation of tin in Indis Indonesia and the long-term influence of and local landscapes in agricultural um, labor and political systems. So in conversation with Ria is Anna, a lecturer in modern and contemporary arts at the University of York. Her research considers the history of exhibition making and, and arts in the global south and has published articles engaging in the issue of extractivism and human rights violations in the global south. And prior to joining the history of art department um, in New York, Anna was an editor of Apple Journal. So we are going to start things off um, with Ria, who's going to introduce the film to us and then providing that the internet is on our side, um, we will be screening the video through Zoom. Um, we're hoping that the connection is good enough, um, but if there are any technical issues, feel free to watch the link that we sent out to you um, with the Zoom invitation instead. Um, so the video is 18 minutes long and then Anna will join Ria in discussion of the work and we should then hopefully have around 15 um, minutes to go through any questions from the audience. During the um, Riyadh's presentation and the film, we ask you that you turn your microphone off and mute your camera. Um, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to bring them into the Q&A and you can turn your camera back on them if you like. And you can ask your questions using the chat box or pressing the raise your hand function and then you can ask them yourself. Uh, so we'll try and address as many of them as we can, but for time reasons, there is a chance that we might not get through them all. And finally, uh, you can see that I've turned on live transcription for accessibility reasons. Um, so if you want to get rid of this on your screen, there is an option to hide it if you click the arrow by live transcript. So that's all from me. Um, thank you all for coming. And now I will stop sharing this and pass over to Ria. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Francesca, for the generous introductions and also thanks Anna for being here and being in, in discussion um, about this work and I'll probably also about my practice. Um, so yeah, so I'm here to introduce this video work, uh, Kassiterit. Uh, it's an 18 minutes uh, videos uh, from 2019, but I started to think about this project since maybe 2017 or 2016, when the first time I went to the island, the Bangka Island, in the west part of Indonesia. So this, uh, the, the uh, so Bangka Island is a really small island um, uh, in Indonesia. Um, 
but it ha uh, this island uh, passes a lot of the history of extraction in the country, especially thin extraction because the the island itself was on top of the thin bedrock. So most of the soil in the island is um, made of thin, or basically it's a thin island. And um, it ha uh, yeah, probably since the beginning of colonialism in Indonesia, it has been extracted. But even before that, uh, a lot of um, local indigenous people also extract the, the thin in the island. Um, we can go to, to, to details later, but basically um, when I was first time went there in 2016, I've seen a lot of people just like scrapping the soil. And then I asked, I just really ignorantly ask them what they're doing. And then they're saying, and they say to me that, oh, we are mine the thin. And then I'm asking them uh, why and for what. And then they just pointing to my pocket and say that, do you have a phone? And I said, yes, I have a phone. And then the, most of the miners, I think two miners that I met first uh, said that, oh yeah, we mine uh, the thin that they use for that phone. So that kind of like, quite interesting for me at the time especially because i'm um, started to think that as an artist who work a lot with moving images i never know the materiality behind it i never know how how moving images become became a moving images um in terms of its technology so i only know um i only know the the practice of making it without knowing you know the material behind it and then it's kind of like interesting when they say it, uh, about that material, um, about thin, and then the relation to the landscape of the island, also to the human. And then um, I started to dig more and investigate more. And then I went back and forth for the, the, from 2017 to 2019 to do a lot of projects. Not, so not only doing this uh, cassette at the video, but also another projects that will, that investigate this um, relation between thin and human in the island, as well as the global distribution uh, of thin and circulation of thin, especially the, uh, that relates to the uh, moving image technology and screen-based technology. So Cassiterit is uh, the product of one of the pro product of this re research. And um, in this films, I try to imagine um, the, um, when the time the advanced technology could trace uh, their origin, so where they come from, and then um, what kind of landscape where they come from, um, and I th I find it's really interesting because quite often that uh, when you hear something about advanced technology, you forget you tend to forget like um, the the you know the labor that people are. Um, kind of like shared to create this um to, to create this technology and i in this film i try to observe that dynamic as well and then to think about the quote-unquote future of this uh, material especially when this material is also important uh in terms of advanced technology uh, not only artificial intelligence but also you know like renewable energy solar panels and all of this kind of stuff that you know a lot of people think that it's it's the future of um you know resources and stuff so yeah i, I hope that you enjoy the film or the video and then maybe we can go back to the discussion later to discuss more about this uh, work so thanks a lot First of all, thank you very much, uh, Ria, for for allow for sharing this with us and for allowing us to share it uh, with the uh, with our guests uh, today. It's a work that I really really like. There were some technical issues throughout the way, but we can we can talk about it as well about the the consequences of having to do this online that are not also yeah us being able to do this online is enabled by by tin itself but we're also suffering from its consequences uh, today uh, so the first question for you very quickly before we go into more uh, technical aspect is who is natasha or what is natasha 
uh, in your mind? Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Thanks for the question. It's really interesting question. So basically the name Natasha is my partner's name. Uh, but um, I used an, I used her name in this film as also some kind of like um, maybe a joke because uh, it's really interesting to 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 use a name that uh, not so Indonesia but it's it's very um, common in Indonesia to have this kind of like Western style name uh, because of the legacy of colonialism as well. But um, yeah, but uh, in this work, uh, uh, I try to imagine the the time when um, uh, you know most of the as for as per now most of this uh, uh, what what do you call it? like assistants like AI a voice generate assistants uh, almost uh, has a female name and also has a as a um, uh, um, you know almost like gendered. And uh, in this in this um, film, I try to imagine what if if there's this kind of like a moment where an AI uh, named Natasha tried to think about uh, you know its origin, where where they come from, and then what they're made of, um, because they're already you know this AI already has this uh, sentient kind of like you know. Uh, um, be I don't know behave like a sentient so it's like it's always questioning their existence and and um and their being so yeah I guess in this film I try to to use this kind of narrative to to tell to to tell about the you know the dynamic of labor and the dynamic of extractions in the in the island in the Banka island brilliant thank you uh, in your article I read your article the site psychogeophysics of Banka Island um, and you discussed in this article and maybe I can post it in, in the chat in case anyone else is interested in reading it, it it's really interesting yeah it's really interesting uh, but in this article you discuss tin in the context of what Jane Bennett calls a vital material and by this uh, and it's related to what you were just saying now I think with, the, with selecting the, this voice uh, by this, she means how the substance uh, almost has agency of its own uh, beyond its status as a commodity. So how do you think tin in Banka Island has activated itself, uh, maybe historically, as a vital material beyond this status as a commodity? Yeah, I mean, uh, so first of all, the, the presence of tin in the island has always existed exist since the beginning of there's a human in the island so going back to the earliest find of thin is also really interesting so the local um, indigenous community in the island um, according to to them in the first maybe first century or even before first century they found the thin when they are burning the landscape for a, you know uh, sweden agriculture so to, to 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 do an agriculture they do a lot of slash and burn and when they burned the landscape they found this kind of like um so, oh, kind of like a grayish and shelfish material in the soil and it was a thin and for them it's like oh so this uh, the the landscape the the thin in the soil gives them life because it gives them a foundation to stand up uh, basically the soil it gives them some sort of platform to stand up as a human being and then at the same time they also use the thin as an adornment and as a part of the, the, they have their own gift economy system, which they share this adornment as some sort of kind of like, you know, social uh, to to construct a social order. So the circulation of thin stays in the community, and because uh, thin become a vital part in their in in their community, it it also gives them a reason to exchange and to communicate to each other. Uh, of course, this uh, form of exchange is not a form of uh, exchange value in the sense of, you know, commodity based uh, exchange value that you exchange something because it has, um, it has, uh, I don't know, economic or financial value or technological value in the, in the, maybe in the contemporary time when thin is used for uh, material, material for uh, phone or for screen based technology, whatever. So for them, it's like the value is very symbolic. 
and uh, this symbolic value um, uh, uh, illustrate the kinship be between the community. So the tin become their agency to actually creating this uh, kinship uh, between uh, between themselves. And of course, this uh, worldview uh, ch uh, change when the tin itself circulates uh, um, outside this uh, outside this idea of you know gift and. Uh, start to accumulate it as a material to creating something or to create a, a tools that actually has a different kind of value than than the dormant. So it's also really interesting how to see uh, the thing itself um, somehow has an agency and evolve uh, in terms of its practical use and in, in terms of value. And I think it's really important to see that you know the, the 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 human valuation of thin or human uh, how human value thin is always evolved and then I think uh, maybe in Kassiter it is also a questions that um, you know with the with the upcoming technology um, as thin has become so fire uh, so vital in in our daily life uh, what could we imagine you know the next step of thin after after I don't know after maybe the the technology. Yeah, and I think something really interesting in the video is that it became really visible how two forms of value coexist, how the indigenous people uh, value tin also in relation to time scales that you that you know that the video uh, mentions, but also as a commodity, and these two are able to coexist. And related to that, what, if, if any, um, do you think is the role of art or of artistic practices in reimagining or in helping us to reanimate uh, our relationship to materials in general, I mean, in this case, tin, but beyond us engaging uh, with it as a mere product for our consumption or as a substance that is infinitely uh, available and always there at our disposal. Yeah, I think, I guess to reflect to this video, uh, my approach is to, in, in terms of like artistic practice, is again is always to imagining um, this. Um, you can say the reenchantment with the with the material or like you know with the mineral the, the thin, and I guess the imagination and speculation part is the most uh, important in this discussion in terms of like you know artistic practice. And I would say um, at the same time uh, through an investigation that might uh, work in this context of artistic research, one could also open the black box of the, you know, entanglement between the idea of technology and the idea of mineral and then the labor and then also, you know, the non-human as well, uh, more than human, um, and see uh, this relationship to material uh, somehow always uh, come from a knowledge that is uh, really situated in one landscape. In this case, in maybe in Bangka Island, that thin has a different kind of value in, in the island that m maybe a lot of people um, not knowing about that, you know, like uh, quite often that people know mineral as some sort of like have a economic value or, um, you know, um, yeah, use value or like exchange value in the sense of the, the capitalistic way of thinking about value. But maybe in the island, it's a different way. And I think um, uh, my the role of artistic practice could also work as some sort of to engage with this idea of thinking uh, about value and thinking about the mineral outside or beyond the idea of, um, you know, established uh, notion of value that we understand today. Yeah, thank you. I agree. And I also, art is one of maybe the very few spheres uh, left in the world, especially moving, moving image, where we can collapse uh, temporal uh, forms into this one uh, space. That's what I thought it was interesting, if, whether you thought that art had any type of potential in, in, in relation to how we recalibrate our experience of the world or of our the materials that are like almost second nature uh, to also to speak. Uh, now your work or this work in particular, in my view, uh, brings to the surface or makes uh, visible a significant amount of facts and histories of uh, mining in Banka Island. Could you talk uh, to us uh, a bit about what the work conceals? Like what are the stories told by human and non-human uh, multiplicities, multiplicities, as Macarena Gomez Barris would, would call that, 
that don't appear in the film. So in other words, um, this work is the embodiment of, uh, of some sort of catastrophic beauty. And to me, it's clear uh, why it's beautiful, what's beautiful about this landscape. But I wonder if you could tell us more about what's in a way behind that beauty or what's the catastrophic aspect to it. Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, it's really interesting because that it's almost like an altered nature. And um, there's always, there. there's kind of like a sublime uh, feeling when you see this uh, really, um, um, uh, really, uh, um, you know, weird looking nature, um, uh, uh, you know, an altered nature uh, because of extraction. But anyway, I always <clears throat> interested in the idea of also beautiful postcard image and uh, the landscape of Banka Island, I think provides that. And behind that uh, beautiful landscape and that somehow look like an alien landscape as well, like a really science fiction-y, um, there is, um, uh, of course, max, uh, massive extractions going on. And this massive extractions uh, um, uh, generates an, uh, this altered nature that we also, you know, find it like really sublime and, uh, you know, we fascinate with uh, ab about it. And, and then this is really interesting when we talk about how even the local government also commodified the abandoned mining uh, as a tourist attractions. Uh, in in Banka because it has that you know what you call catastrophic beauty um, and in terms of uh, human and non-human relationship um, I think what also really interesting for me is the context of animism and I think in the film uh, uh, there is a mention about the idea that capitalism also you know somehow feel like um, like a, a different form of animism because it look um, it looks material as a vital animating things and uh, uh, in a sense that in in the video it, it um, uh, I try to also like observe that capitalism is more animist than the animist itself in the island because they tend to animating thing until it can be animating anymore you know like always escalating the idea of animating because there it's it's the idea of uh, 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 accumulation and 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 the idea of uh, um, uh, creating more value, uh, but for the local indigenous, um, which is um, in in the Banka, it's called uh, Orang Lom. Uh, this is not always the case. So there is almost no growth and accumulation in terms of like you know thin exchange. And uh, there's also an interesting um, conversation I had with one of the miner in the island, which come from the Orang Lom community that he says um, the world that they inhabit uh, in Banka is supposed to be balanced. So massive extraction disrupts this um, you know, balance um, between human and the, and the natural world and make the mineral and also the earth couldn't keep up with the acceleration and then the advance of uh, the, 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 crea uh, the creation of new technology that uh, a lot of the of people are doing today. So different kind, uh, different than any other um, extraction uh, land in Indonesia, Banka Island is particularly uh, um, unique because it's the earliest uh, island in 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 the archipelago in in, in the archipelago that you know um, experienced a massive extraction since even the beginning of colonialism. Um, but anyway, so most of the human connection uh, for so many years in the island has been somehow, you know, far from, from the mineral itself. And if we talk about today, the even the scientific endeavor, you know, the scientific attempt in the island is also still think about that idea of extraction is good for the growth and the progress of the island. And I think in Kassiterit, there's this uh, Dr. Eddie Nurtahia. He's a well-respected biologist in the island. He talked a lot about his idea of phytomining, which is implementing another non-human agent. Um, in this case, the hyperaccumulator plants, I don't know, like uh, broccoli or something like that, that could suck up and siphon all of the material, uh, all of the mineral in the soil, and then use the use these plants as some sort of kind of like, you know, mining machine. So for him, it's like, we should, change all of the mining technology into this organic and non-human mining um, plants 
which I find it really interesting his idea and then uh, all the con uh, but again all the all the connection to mineral in the island it's still connected to the to uh, to the idea of growth and progress which I think it's totally different than how the um, indigenous people for example think about um, the circulation of thin and all, all, all their or their relation to to the um, you know non-human or the natural world around it around them I mean I I hope that answer your questions. It's a bit convoluted, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. I also was very interested to learn about how you used a psychogeophysics as a, no, not only as a, as a concept that it's interesting for you, but also as a method or as a methodology through which you seem to have uh, conducted part of the artistic research in this project. Um, so, uh, yeah, this entailed uh, walking, talking to people, a bit of DIY uh, to build devices, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's how it went. So could you tell us a bit more about this process, about this artistic research and what's gained and what's lost by doing research with your whole body, rather than just reading about uh, tin extraction in the island, probably quite different to the experience to how you had to do the PhD or something like that. Yeah, so yeah, in, in, in the introduction, I I try to tell the, the story that how I went to the island and, you know, my, I think my engagement with the island started in 2016, at uh, 2017, and it grew and grew. And then because of that, and then I try to always um, experimenting with a lot of methodology. One of them is the psychogeophysics. So the idea of psychogeophysics is basically an appropriation of psychogeography by the situationist. And I use the, the actually the term psychogeophysics itself is already used by a, a group of researchers in, in UK, I think. But uh, for them, it's much more about this occult and then, you know, more about the idea of the um, uh, uh, seeing uh, try to finding ghosts or whatever in the in the geophysics um, landscape but I try to kind of like um, twist that idea and for me it's 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 more interesting to to think about the the um, social and political dynamics and how it relates to geophysics and um, and also on the other part it's like uh, uh, I'm using psychogeophysics as a method because the quite often the psychogeography which um, you know um, used by the situation is are really urban centric and in this case uh, Banka is not if it's not urban at all and it's it's pretty much like rural and um, at the same time I also want to focus more on geology instead of geography so it's like more on the formation of the island and then more on rocks and more on the thin and how uh, thin actually and how we understand thin as a as not only as um, material for technology but also as a geo as a geological uh, being um, and in terms of like what I gain uh, from this practice, it's it's really interesting because a lot of uh, experience that I had is something that I don't plan before <laughs> because I do a lot of walking. So I'm, I met a lot of people who are actually not in my, you know, usually I have a plan where who, who I should meet. And when I do walk, I meet a lot of people that I don't um, expect to meet. So for example, I meet a... Uh, a lady who opened uh, some sort of kind of like snack stand for tourists. And then from her, I, I listen a lot about the idea of, you know, domestic work in the island that somehow avoided uh, a lot. So a, a lot of people think about the extraction is only a man went to the, to the field and then extract the mineral. But for her, it's, 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 you know, the domestic work is also like really important, for example, like cooking in the house and preparing meal for the male, for the men to, to, to mine. So those kind of encounter that I found through psychogeophysics is really uh, fascinating. Also, the way that I work together with the miners, um, especially making videos with the miners is also something that I find it uh, fascinating. And and the downside of it is it's really um, because the island itself is really controlled by the government, the Indonesian government. So it's kind of risky to, to, to do just like wandering around uh, because the um, one of the biggest corporation, uh, actually state-owned corporation in the island, 
is monopolizing all of the uh, mine, all of the mining field. And um, quite often uh, I get surveilled. So that's like, I think in the films, I met a, a, a police uh, in Kankasitari. There's a, the, the police guy asking me like what, what, what I'm doing and blah, blah, blah. So that's the cut version. But I have uh, a longer version of that in which that uh, they interview me and asking me a lot of questions and then asking me what I'm doing. And I said that I'm an artist and they don't believe that I'm an artist. And I have to lie to them and say that I'm a geologist. And then they started to believe me. Okay, so geologists, you can do research, but you cannot ask the miners a lot of questions because, you know, some miners are really, they can talk you about all of the problem in the, in the island and they don't want to, that to be like outside the island. So that's kind of like the downside of it to encounter a lot of, you know, um, uh, this kind of um, authority or like people who control the island. And thank you. We have a couple of questions. I have some more, but I think let's open it to the public because I think they, they have lots of really interesting questions. So Nigu asks, it's really interesting, the predominantly corporate dilemma behind today's AI is to create data mining systems convincing enough to act like humans without crossing the line of pretending to be one. I wonder how can we liberate current not so AI from having to pretend to understand humans by exploring less goal driven assemblages and less hierarchical relationships between machines and other entities, including both, including, sorry, but not limited to humans. Mm. Yeah, I, that's really interesting questions. I think in the films, there's also a, a discussion about measuring, like, you know, all of the, uh, the AI think about something um, always related to data because you can measure everything and then you know scientifically everything has to be rationalized and everything has to be could be like measured and stuff and I think that's all that's something that needs to think about when someone or like I don't know like tech giants or whatever think about creating an AI, an AI uh, if they want to reach a, a level where well, when the AI could think about something beyond the idea of that i mean it's not when when we when we think about something in terms of human we always think not only rationally but we also think something that irrationally you know something related to like i don't know like a transcendental feeling spiritualism dreams whatever it's something that you cannot scientifically expose maybe someday i don't know but uh, in this case in terms of ai this kind of like mistakes and messiness in 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 in, in human is also something that i find it fascinating to to be to think about if the ai could reach that kind of point and i think in this in the in Kassiter, it, uh, natasha is trying to 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 think about that that's why um it's it trying to 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 think about the where 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 it comes from you know those kind of questions is unmeasured you know like it's 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 those kind of questions that are even unanswered in in the in humanity you know even in philosophy maybe so that's kind of like um idea that i found it interesting i don't know if that answered the questions but uh for me um in terms of approaching an ai there's always a possibility to think about um, something more than just a data set and then, you know, measurement and yeah. Thank you. There is a question from Amber Hill. Uh, she says, I noticed that you didn't mention political corruption as part of the video and focus mm -hmm. more on the social factors of mining. I came into this lecture having read up on Elon Musk's purchase of an island in West Papua, Indonesia for both mining and to build a new space X launch pad. Do you think this is political corruption as a result of the climate impact or just business as usual? Should we look at it as political corruption or capitalism? That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's always connected. Political corruption and capitalism is kind of like, you know, it's it's the same roots, same problem. Uh, but yeah, political corruption in Indonesia, you know, it's it's very it's 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 really rooted in the history, and and then especially we we have uh, a long uh, long year of uh, military dictatorship as well. And military dictatorship in Indonesia opens by also you know 
um, uh, really a huge exploitations of natural resources, maybe started from the, the West Papua, uh, the gold mining. Uh, but the, in terms of Banka Island, it's, it has been there. The extraction that has been there even before the um, you know, military dictatorship or political corruption in the sense of you know, local political corruptions. So um, that kind of dynamic that I found, it's more um, interesting to talk about because it's more broad and then really connected to the whole to the whole world system, I would say, you know, like the way the, the way people think about material. And of course, um, in the films, there's a little bit a discussion about the political corruption, but mostly related to the to the one, uh, the only um, uh, 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 state owned corporation that monopolized the resources. Monopolizing metal, which is Patatima. And I think that's also like really um, uh, uh, important in this discussions because all the. So I have to go back to explain. So um, the in 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 Bank Island, there's a two different form of mining. One is the big giant massive uh, uh, um, uh, massive company, state-owned company called Patatima, and the other is the local uh, in con uh, we we call it in Indonesia we call it unconventional miners, which is like illegal small scale or artisanal miners. And um, uh, these artisanal miners, mostly they mine the abandoned mining uh, field that has been left by the Petatima. So this is really interesting to, 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 to see how they are uh, scrapping the left offer of the thin and then try to make live uh, from, from that. And uh, of course, it really relates also to the to the to the uh, to the corruptions of the of the local government as well as the company. Um, but uh, to be more precise, is the monopolizing of natural resources that also really, I think, important in this discussion. At at the same time, you know, company like big company that also demand this thing i don't know like apple samsung etc etc they're also one that also at some point have um you know uh responsibility to to this i mean you also mentioned elon musk and then um yeah and then probably he is also one of them who 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 think that he can control the natural resources and then work together with the local government to exploit and extract and um, Liu Mangun is saying, thank you for sharing the work. Riyadh, could you talk a bit more on how you relate the termination and free will to a reflection of time and how tem uh, temporarily becomes a dimension? Ah, yeah, temporality, I guess, becomes a dimension of the work. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier about balance when I talked to like uh, the one of the miners. His name is Barim, Bang Barim. And uh, for him, it's it's the idea of time is really important, especially when you have this kind of like a different rhythm in terms of living. So he he imagined like this. So mining, uh, big mining, uh, extracts the uh, mineral, ex extracts the thin metals from from the from the earth from Bank Island from Bank Island without uh, you know synchronize the rhythm of the earth in terms of producing this this thing because a lot of people especially in the in the geologists uh in the geology um scene or like you know a lot of geologists think that thin could 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 not reproduce and for uh but for the people in the island they 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 still believe that um you know well the the earth could still reproduce thin because the whole the whole world the whole earth is basically a cycle so you know people die and then people could be a thin for them and then um and then the the idea of time is like because we accelerate the extraction so we we don't give time for the earth to reproduce so basically we uh, we kind of like exhausted the earth and then 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 it's really important for them in terms of like concept of time uh, because uh, it's actually against the idea of balance. And then the Orang Lom community, the local indigenous community, they have this like huge um, uh, concept about balance that uh, they keep for su such a long time. And then now it's like the, uh, with the automation of new technology as well, uh, that, that, that could uh, extract in from the island more and more in terms of, you know, like uh, quantity, but also in terms of like uh, uh, accelerations that could be, that could become a, another problem and on the other side 
there's also an, an a interesting conversation I had with uh, with the miners when we talk about uh, how we don't uh, with uh, in Indonesian and then probably like Malay based language, we don't have the 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 concept of time in terms of like tenses. So it's like uh, everything that happens is always happens now. And so we don't have futures and the past. And for them, it's like, oh, but uh, this company that extract the thin, they always think about futures. And then, but uh, but they don't, they never think about now. So in, in the film, uh, in, in Cassetere, there's a discussions about the idea of maybe if we think about time uh, differently, especially based on the, you know, uh, some, uh, in the, uh, uh, Malay root uh, language uh, grammar or semantics or whatever. Maybe we can try to think of, uh, think about the, the notions of time differently, and then that relates to the idea again about the accelerations and uh, um, you know degrowthing or like you know slowing slowing the pace of the of the mining uh, process. I think we're out of time. I just have one last question now that we're talking about uh, yeah, renewable energy, basically, that also also implies time. So to move from a fossil fuel based economy to renewable energy, we mm. need to rely on metals, right, such as tin uh, to produce and maintain energy, energy convention technologies. So Western economies, and we see this, this in the news probably every day now, so Western economies take pride in announcing targets related to sustainability and green economy. But as your work seems to indicate, this is often at the, at the expense of human and non-human livelihoods in the global south. So what do you think can be done about that? Do you think art has sort of a role to play in making such tensions visible? Yeah, um, I might be a little naive here, but I think uh, art at some point could bring an awareness to what happened in the other part of the world. And in this case, the global south, maybe. And the notion that you might experience a nice life at the expense of human and non-human livelihoods in the other part of the world is something that could be discussed and observed through practice that investigate these tensions in which through art, this kind of discussion is expanded outside, you know, the journalistic or academic domain, I think it could be like, you know, broaden the knowledge. And on the other hand, as I also uh, previously, previously also mentioned that um, maybe arts allows us to speculate. And I think this power to speculate might resonate with people, at least to understand the dynamic of what happened to their life or you know how they could relate to what happened in the other part of the world and i always like the word that um, again the one of the minor bang barim says to me that um uh all of this problem could be uh, easily solved uh if uh humans stop obsess about growth and progress and still th uh, and start to think about uh red redistributions instead and I think redistributions in terms of wealth and access to all knowledge is quite important. And I guess um, there's also like really interesting anecdote when he made these comments once he saw Cassiterit the films, where he says that, oh, I don't understand at all what you're trying to, what you're trying to say. And then it's because uh, he says it's because I don't have the same educations with you. And I think that's the core of the problem. It's the um, undistributed knowledge in the world that makes us, you know, somehow has this kind of like a different kind of, um, yeah, diff different kind of experience. And I think that's um, redistributions and distributions of knowledge is important. And I think maybe art is also one part of them that could work, um, you know, better, I guess, I don't know. Thank you. Yes, I agree. That's brilliant. I think we're out of time. I think we're five minutes over. So I think over to Francesca. Uh... Yeah, thank you very much. That's um, thank, thank you, Ria and Anna for that. That's a really, really fascinating conversation. And uh, I think a good point to end on as well. Um, yeah, also thank you for our audience for the questions and for coming. Uh, we realize it's a Friday afternoon and it's the first week of term here as well, so everyone's very busy. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this is the last in the series of our talks, so we appreciate all the support that we've had throughout of it. Um, I think, I hope you've enjoyed it. 
Um, but yeah, that's it from us. Again, thank you to Ria and Anna for your time and for your generosity and your um, and your work and what you've shared with us. Um, but yeah, I think other than that, unless anyone has anything else to add, I think I will leave it there. Um, no, just thank you very much, Francesca and Luis, for organizing this incredible series. I think it has been super interesting and it has enabled also a lot of people with similar interests to, to meet and for us to think together. So thank you so much for organizing this and thank you, Ria, so much for this. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your generosity and, and I'm really looking forward to see to seeing your work that uh, opens this week in the sixth, a new work in the Jogja Biennial. So if anyone is interested, please uh, keep um, keep tuned and hopefully we can speak again because there's so many more questions that, that I have for you. So it will be great to have you again. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for inviting me. And thanks everyone for being here. I, yeah, I found it's really interesting and fruit. I hope that it's also fruitful to everyone. And I've just seen someone's asked if we have access for talks. We do plan on putting our talks online afterwards. So if there are any others that you missed, you will, you will have access. Um, so check the website soon in the next few weeks and they should all be up. Um, yeah, thank you very much for everyone. Um, I hope you all enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Have a lovely weekend and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. That's a lot. Bye. Bye.